Khalid Lim South Asian Middle East Forum. Uh, thank you for your, all your presentations. Um, I think it's very important uh, what uh, Rana said about ownership of the projects and partnership with people on the ground. And I think this is a failing of uh, DFID uh, that they want to institute things, but they don't want to get people's feedback on what's actually taking place. Uh, even in London, you sometimes contact DFID and you'll, and you'll say to them, what about this, something of Afghanistan or Syria? Oh, we can't talk about this. People are on the gr You need to talk to people in Syria. Everyone's on the ground in, in, in Syria or everyone's in Afghanistan. They need to have people here who also can be accountable for what they're doing. It's not only in, um, in the region, but here as well in London itself. Uh, I think it is, it is important that the people in Syria feel they have part, that it's not just a handout, that they're part, of, part and parcel of the solution. And, and we need to give them that, and that gives them self-respect. If you're just giving, them, just giving them aid without consultation, it doesn't give them respect. And we need to, and we need to respect them. And also, as regards projects, um, Wasim is very right. I think we're not, we need a Marshall Plan for Syria now. They say, they say there's a ceasefire. We need to do big projects in Syria and start doing the planning. And it needs to be an EU-led thing and maybe also through the United Nations. And this needs to be started right now. Thank you. I think it was a gentleman at the back. Hi. Uh, uh, my name is Jake Leyland. I'm with MSF, but this is more of a personal uh, question. Um, for Rana, you mentioned... Um, that we really shouldn't forget that people originally were revolting about the lack of governance and a complete void of, of good, there was no good governance in the first place. That's one issue um, that was key to the revolution anyway. Um, and so is, are, you, are you able to um, not necessarily speculate, but suggest what the consequences of persistent failings in implementing good governance as it is perceived by local Syrians might be, um, or could anyone answer a question to that effect? Thank you. Thanks, and gentlemen. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you for ODI for hosting this <coughs> event. Uh, my name is Othman Mokbel. I'm the CEO of Human Appeal International. I just came from the parliament. We had an event there with some MPs and lords related to the same uh, topic and uh, we were discussing a few things but I want just to pick one of the things which was were discussed there about education and jobs income generation and uh, education and I just want to raise a question maybe uh, how can we have schools have hospitals while the air strikes especially from the Russians are continuously keeping destroying what we built. Last month, three, four schools, one of them is for us. Hospitals for MSF, doctors we trained. I was with them in November in Turkey. Some of them killed in, in uh, one of the hospitals, MSF hospital in, the, uh, in Aleppo. So security. We need to think about safe, at least, areas, not only for the people who are inside, but for us as NGOs to be able to deliver our, our work. Yes, we will continue establishing school, let them destroy school, we'll establish a school, same with hospitals, same with other things, but till when? Therefore, we need to put somehow pressure our government, other governments, to bring this conflict to an end. Because I think we still, we will do it, deal with the symptoms, but what about the root of the, of the conflict? Uh, the other point I want to raise about the migration, the migrants to Europe, same this one of the points discussed today. And the statistics saying that 7.5% of the IDBs and refugees, Syrian IDBs and refugees, have applied for asylum in Europe. Means that majority are there, they are not interested, they just need safe area there to establish their day-to-day -day life. Therefore, we need to give more support to Jordan, to Lebanon, to Turkey, to keep the Syrians either in Syria or 
in the neighboring countries, but need, we need to create jobs. We need to create opportunities. And thanks for Turkey, which just announced last month when I was there, that they will create 500,000 jobs during the next three years only for Syrians. But Jordan and Lebanon are not in the same economical situation of Turkey. So we need to give more support to these countries in order to keep the Syrians in that part, especially, just my last point, that we notice that the cream, the lions of Syrians people who managed to come here. This means the professionals. So who will rebuild Syria later? Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's start with this, and then um, I'll, I'll, I'll hope we can take another round. But please be brief in your questions so I can take a few more. And a reminder to the online audience that they can post questions through the online chat, and I will um, put them to the panelists. Uh, let's start with the, uh, you know, Khalid's point about the importance of also have accountability back here, you know, to defeat in terms of you know, what happens on the ground, and then, you know, link it to the question from the colleague um, uh, from MSF around the persistent failing of good governance programming and what is the accountability to that. I don't know who wants to go first. We start with John and go this way, back to Dan Nigel, and then I'll change the route. Um, uh, yes, I mean, one of the issues that we faced, and indeed the people who are implementing Tamkeen are facing, is that this is remotely managed programming. This is a country where it's not possible for the managers of the aid organizations to go regularly inside the country into those areas where the projects are being implemented. So therefore, is there, there inevitably is this sort of cascade of, of uh, subcontracting that goes down, uh, and it ends up being very much a localized type of organization that's really then accountable to the next layer up, which is usually one that's based in Gaziantep or somewhere like that, and then which is in turn accountable to uh, an international organization, which is in turn accountable to DFID or whoever. You know. So by the time you get down to the ground, you've already gone through about four layers. Um, and uh, this, is, this, is, um, this is remote management, uh, and this is something we're facing not only in, in Syria, but also in places like Afghanistan and elsewhere. Um, and of course, there are the usual financial, potential financial uh, problems here. There's lots of other accountability issues as well that may surround that type of remote management system. Um, I think the, the um, uh, in defense of Tamkeen, and, and as I said right from the beginning, by the way, I don't work for Tamkeen, so I don't have to defend them, but in defense of Tamkeen, um, there has been quite a significant effort to involve local people uh, in both the selection of projects and also in the committees and how they're constructed. Um, yes, indeed, there was some imposition from above, um, and there are certainly standards which they are expected to adhere to. They are international standards. It's true that and it's a, a quite a legitimate question for Rana to ask, you know, what do we mean by governance? Are we, is this something that's de defined from outside? Um, yes, it is to some extent. And I must admit, if, it, if I were being s exceptionally critical of Tamkeen, I would say the problem is that they tried to impose a model uh, which was decided outside of the country. But it wasn't entirely that the case. Um, actually, uh, it was, it was uh, the design of the program was done quite closely with uh, a number of Syrians who'd been involved in local governance in, in the country prior to this period. Um, so, it, it, you know, the, the, the design wasn't entirely sort of imposed from above. Um, that said, there are still minimum standards which uh, any aid organization are, is expected to adhere to. And there are also minimum standards to which British government money, for instance, must adhere to in order for it to, uh, to disperse those funds. Um, the question then is, is, is to what extent are you able to make compromises on either side? Incidentally, the, the, uh, the local councils in, inside opposition-held areas in Syria are not elected. There is, this is not an election process. Neither was the Tamkeen committees elected. They weren't. They were selected. Uh, and uh, 
so, so I don't think the issue of election necessarily was uh, was was uh, loomed large in all of this. Uh, do you want to address the question around the, you know, what are the consequences of failing persistently to implement these kind of problems? Yeah, um, just to build a little bit. Um, again, I'm not working for Tamkin either, <laughs> but to be. To do them justice, they're one of the better um, uh, implementers. Um, um, yet again, I, I still feel very strongly about you know the accountability part, and um, and I believe Syrians feel do, and that's why they've created this big Facebook page called Hake with the Donor, or this is what the donor wants. And you know some of the comments are really meaningless, but some of them you know have very important implications. Um, sometimes I think, you know, just looking into this page is a research in itself. Um, so, so this tells you how important that is. And if, if it's remotely managed, why can't the evaluation be remotely managed uh, by the locals as well? I mean, we know that Gaziantep is the hub, but a lot of the Syrians are going, you know, to Gaziantep and back to Syria. And, so there are ways, creative ways, uh, as uh, Nigel suggested, we can deal with this creatively um, if we really want to. Um, uh, um, yeah, and th that's why I'm saying they're one of the better ones. I can give the example of uh, establishing the police where one of the governments actually asked for the ID of every policeman uh, employed on the ground, which to Syrians was, this is our own security. Why? You know, who, how, where is the transparency in here? You want, you know, is it only for you? So where's our ownership here when you want the IDs of every single policeman employed? So this raises a lot of questions, you know. Um, and a lot of these big implementers are referred to as mukhabarat or security services for international governments. Uh, Tamkin was not, actually. That's why I'm saying it's one of the uh, better ones. But to the other question on the implications of uh, failed good governance, according to, to the Syrians, that, that's a really good question, actually. And, and that, that's my bigger fear. You know, what happens? Uh, do we move into a state of more fragi uh, fragility? Um, uh, war economy, you know, is this where the power is already there? And are we moving into another extreme case uh, of this? Um, losing the agency, sometimes I look into Lebanon, I'm like, is the future of Syria, you know, where each group would, would be a client to one state or the other? And, and um, oh, is it a time bomb where you have um, small areas with small dictatorships here and here and here and there? and and then we're moving into another kind of revolt, more insecurity. What are we moving into? And this is my fear with the uh, uh, seize the fire. Um, I, I see it as a you know great opportunity, but are we just freezing the conflict there? And that's why that's exactly why I said we need to address issues of justice referred to uh, again uh, by the audience. Can I just add one one thing? Um, one, one thing that we also noted over time was the increasing dependency of these councils on external funding. Um, and I think this, this dependency thing, what, what's actually happened is that external donors have um, influence and are increasingly influencing the ways in which people apply for money as well. Uh, we noticed, for example, in the recent uh, needs assessment that we're doing that that they're beginning to get to a point now where they're answering the right questions and they're answering it in the way that you expect them or that you want them to answer, you know. Which means that in Syria now we have a situation where even at a very local council, they know exactly what to say to attract funds, you know. And this is symptomatic of the, of the way in which, you know, historically this thing has sort of evolved, that there's... Um, there's the dependency on external funding is, 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 has got to the point where it's become sort of professionalized, if you like. Um, and that's extremely difficult to get past, uh, because once the, once the word spreads, everybody knows exactly how to attract uh, external donor money now. Very interesting. Um, can I ask you to address Othman's question? So how do we continue to provide educations, whether, education, whether it is building schools or, you know, have education programs, you know, hospitals, create opportunities for people while the bombs keep dropping? Uh, 
In fact, education or uh, health services uh, never should stop. <clears throat> there is bombing, there is shelling, there is besiege, there is people dying from malnutrition. I remember when we were working in Yarmoukta camp in the biggest time of besiege when there was like ch literally children dying because of malnutrition or lack of services or lack of uh, medicine. We were in a big we were running a school there and we were in a big discussion. We should stop the education program. It's not safe anymore and we have many cases where children are not able to, to concentrate on the lessons and not able to study. We were in discussion with the children and with the families. It is a request from the families to continue the education. It's a request from the children themselves to continue the education. Uh, you are right. We cannot plan for long. We cannot uh, concentrate on what we are doing because there is shilling, there is... Uh, by the way, the shelling is not only from the Russian or from it's, it's, it's a common it's a common it's a common life in, in, in Syria now in all over the location. It can be concentrated more on the opposition control area, especially with the Russian intervention. But since day one, there is shelling. Since day one, there is hospitals uh, shelled. Since day one, there is targeting of schools. And. We cannot tell how we how we can continue because it's not our our decision. It's local it's local people who who decide to continue. We wish this will stop and there is any kind of a protection for uh, relief workers or teachers or doctors or whoever. But it, this is an injustice war, where nothing called justice is understood in in, in Syria. And this is very important because if we really want to rebuild this country or uh, reconciliate this country, justice should take a, a place. And when justice take a place, people will go back to, to, to live with each other. I wish uh, that your question was answered. To, uh, yesterday, the Russian told they, were, they are withdrawing from the country, so maybe <laughs> they, can, they, can, they, can, uh, they can answer this. Nadja, would you like to add any thoughts on any of the questions? Sure, a couple. One is on this, this what Wesham has just said, and, and the person who questioned, how, you, how can you build schools under this bombardment? That's one, and I, I want to come back to a phrase I hate, which is building back better. But anyway, on the, on the issue of bombardment schools, I think we need to make sure we have in mind what we're facing right now is a massive crisis in terms of the failure of protection and the failure of respect for IHL. Um, that often comes back to humanitarian actors, the uh, difficulty of getting access, etc. Um, the World Humanitarian Summit is looking at protection, and one of the things they're looking at is a more rigorous system of accountability of humanitarian leaders, whether they're of agencies or of humanitarian leaders of ground operations. But I think that's missing the point that this is more fundamentally a political issue and an issue of massive political failure and political cynicism. Um, you look at a general tendency of, of, of military and political actors, uh, and often they're from the same governments that are providing humanitarian funding. They, they co-opt humanitarian language to justify political and, and, and military intervention. Um, if you look at the co-opting of humanitarian assistance, I think this, this, this was said, perhaps it was John, um, it has to be faced that um, donors do co-opt humanitarian assistance and to some extent some agencies may let themselves be co-opted when, when um, agencies become in a sense the subcontractors of donors rather than autonomous, independent. But I think the main issue is, is we have to address the failure of protection and I would say the declining respect for international humanitarian law that we've seen in recent years and it's not only in, in, in Syria, it's Iraq, it's Yemen, it's, you can go further to Sudan, to Somalia, and so on. Um, in particular, we, we are living right now with a toothless talk shop, which is called the UN Security Council. And it's been failing for years on, on Syria. That is squarely in the political domain. So how can we as actors in our own polities start to insist, pressure, change this dynamic. I mean, it's you look at the ICRC conference of last December, years in preparation, how can we develop a new 
international humanitarian framework regime. All it did is say we have to keep talking. Uh, it, it couldn't come to a conclusion. So I think this is one, the failure of protection. We have to sort of dig at it. What is it? How can we start to address it? Because we're failing at the moment. The world is failing at the moment. Just a note, too, on one of my bugbears. I hate the term building back better because it's got that word back in it. And you can't look backwards. Crises are not the same as when they start. Syria is very different from what it was when the conflict started. But it's going to have total destruction of infrastructure. It will have lost tens of thousands of qualified professionals and skilled workers. They've either been killed or driven out. That demands from now thinking the day after when the conflict stops, what are we going to do innovatively, which combine, for example, forms of remote learning with with whatever's left of, of capacity on, on the ground to teach kids, um, remote transfers. Uh, so I think we are not, again, if we're thinking of the future, we can't build back better. We have to build better and differently. So. If we could get rid of the build back better from our lexicon, I think it would be a great move forward. Agreed. No. Agreed. We've written a paper on that, so very much agree with you. Gentlemen, yeah, just to say, we just, we've got just over 10 minutes. So if you can be brief in your questions, then I'll take them all. David, David Harrison, uh, formerly of the International Development Committee, and, but here as a lover of Syria. Um, you've hit it out a bit, but presumably the situation on the ground in Syria is very diverse, and in some areas, education continues and the economy works to a certain extent. So if you could just give a bit of a flavour of that. And secondly, one of the areas which I had thought might have been um, one of those slightly better areas, like the Kurdish area, is now threatened by a sort of onslaught from Turkey. And I just wondered if you could say a bit about the consequences of that Turkish onslaught. Thank you. Thank you. Um, lady? That's okay. Hi, I'm Ashley from Initiatives of Change. Um, we work on an international conference called Just Governance on Human Security. Um, my question is, how do we as an international community um, support the space for dialogue at the local level in bringing about an ideological shift, such as a, a human or a valued-centered approach um, versus uh, mil militarily or... Um, the things on, on the ground when we're from the international side? How do we support the local side? Thank you. Uh, lady here. Just. Thank you. Uh, Marie Collins from Christian Aid. Um, John, you referred to the relative youth of some of the people serving on the local councils. And I would say that this is also evident across the national NGOs that have started up since the crisis. Um, and as you say, it raises issues in terms of lack of experience and capacity. But would you and the other panel members see that there might also be something positive in this and that they're coming from outside of what Nigel has referred to as quite a flawed structure and that they might be the doorway to the kind of innovative thinking that is recognized as being needed. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Should we start with, the, with Sam and Rana? Maybe you can address the question that David posed about, you know, give us a flavor how things are different on the ground across the different areas and where things are, in a way, continuing on a steady pace and where it is more challenging, um, and the particular, you know, reference to the Kurdish area as well. Don't know who wants to. Rana. <laughs> um, I'll, uh, hmm. That's a difficult question. You know, I will start thinking of each area and how different it and how fluid it is. Definitely, the Kurdish areas have been the, the safest um, in terms of a, a, and the best able to create their own governance. Interestingly, in the Kurdish areas, not a lot of. Um, the external governance implementer has been able to cooperate uh, to operate and because the PYD and, and the Rojava uh, has taken care of this um, and it has been going on relatively better than the other because they were allowed the opportunity to create something the security situation was a lot better for them um, um, I think um, 
what's happening will definitely uh, affect the security situation and already um, 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 already they're, they're facing a lot of youth migration issues, although the Kurdish areas have, are relatively a lot, you know, doing better than the other non-government control part. So you have uh, a strong youth migration. They've been already facing it without this insecurity problem. Add to it this insecurity problem. So definitely it will affect uh, the ability to provide for education, I think, in that sense, um, let alone the migration of teachers, etc. Sorry, I cannot go deeper into that, so we can talk about it in detail uh, after that. And about the question, um, yeah, should I just, uh, the other questions, address the other questions? You can question? address the other questions. Okay. Other so um, um, about the question about creating a space for dialogue, do you mean in the international community or the international local community or amongst the locals? Okay, um, hmm. I can tell you basically what's happening, um, what's not working. Uh, out of experience, when you just bring people to come and talk, nothing happens. When you bring them to do something together, they eventually talk and you create the space uh, because there's a common goal in the end of the day. Um, what's happening with Syrians usually, you know, whenever, um, Syrians go to one of those international community hubs. They're usually the elite, the English-speaking people, the people who look, you know, like the internationals, and even to the locals, you know, inside the world. Part, these Syrians are part of the problem. At some point, I have to look at myself and and think, yeah, you know, um, am I starting to speak a different language? Um, so, but again, you know, the visa issues, no country is giving any, uh, any visa, issue, uh, visa issue to the ones inside because they are afraid they will stay, etc. all those problems. But sometimes I wonder why is technology not used here? And, uh, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of organization has chosen to go and operate from Gaziantep, which is closer to the borders, or f from inside the country where it's safer to operate from there. So that could be one. Using the local o agency, it's uh, such a good opportunity. But again, it depends on the individuals. Whom are we choosing? You know, are we just not to end on this bottom-up um, uh, approach? Um, the fluid structure, it's it's been already there. And that that's part of the biggest, you know, one uh, very positive things uh, that happened to Syria since 2011, where we had no civil society, and suddenly we have those social movements doing all those creative things. But um, as John um, highlighted, the problem is with this projectization of civil society, where, where you know, people could volunteer for year one, year two, year three, but soon after, you know, they need money, and, and the money is with the, with the donors, and at some point they need to speak the language of their donors and tailor their projects to what the donor wants, because very few donors would actually fund the institution. They will always fund a project. So, so um, yes, it is an opportunity, but maybe it's an opportunity for the international donors to rethink the way aid is directed uh, and the way uh, it is dealt with uh, civil society inside. Thank you. Um, well, Sam, do you want to add anything particular around the besieged areas or where the Palestinians are, that, you know, you know more intimately, and any of the other questions that you want to address? Well, it's just what, uh, what I wanted to add, maybe, that <coughs> the problem in, in Syria, that there is no one problem, and there is no one solution, and there is no one representation, and there is no coordination. So not only in the local level, but also on the international level. We see a lot of donors and we, they ask a lot of co why you don't coordinate, why you don't do this, why you don't do this. And we ask them, do you coordinate? <laughs> do really defeat coordinate with OFDA and coordinate with this? And I don't think so. Do really international NGOs coordinate with each other or they compete with each other? It's very clear what's happening. Sometimes in one local area, in one special area, in one besieged area, 
We see 100 organizations that want to open a hospital, and no organization that want to open a school. We see 100 organizations on the time like biggest besiege in Yarmouk camp or other areas. You see, you see this area on the TV, in the BBC, then next day you receive a call, how many food baskets we can enter to this area. We told you since one year we can access this area. You wait until it is on the TV, until it is impossible to enter it because there is a lot of attention. And even the people who, that have the access, not anymore, will have it because you have all this attention on this area. Each area in, in Syria has their own problems and their own uh, uh, solutions. What we want to solve in north of Syria cannot be applied on, on south of Syria. What we want to deal in the Palestinian camps and Palestinian areas cannot be the same on the, on the other areas. What has to be so dealt with in the Kurdish areas or is not the same that is in one meter under the Kurdish area. The problem that there is a criteria, and this criteria is not coming from Syria, and not coming from Syrians. This criteria is both in the international community and in the, the biggest donor. And then, whenever we want to tell, no, we want something else, we are out of the line. Uh, the language of the donor, I spent uh, 13 years working in, in NGOs and in organizations. I still don't, I cannot speak the language of the donor. That's a blessing. I still cannot that speak works. it. Why? Because it doesn't make sense. <laughs> because whenever we, we want to speak what we need, what the people need, we have to speak it in English, and I feel difficulty to speak in English. Uh, many local NGOs, I don't speak only about us, many local NGOs, many local groups in Syria, they have one, one word, we are not reporting officers. We are implementing partners, we are deciding the priority, we should decide what we should do, and we should decide what is our priorities. The problem that the biggest funding, the biggest donor doesn't deal with this. So. As a local NGO, as local people inside Syria, Palestinian or Syrians or Kurdish or even Iraqian inside Syria, we have to, to deal with this and see a clever way to go around this. Let's speak about international NGOs or private businesses who is doing uh, work now inside Syria. How many international people died inside Syria? How many? Uh, international volunteers died inside Syria. Why now all the INGOs and UN agencies and donors is working through Gazi and Tab, not inside Syria? Who is taking the risk? And who is speaking about these people, local people who apply the work, who do the work, and now in the prisons or kidnapped or killed? We spent five years ask for insurance for volunteers who died in, inside Syria to cover their families. Nobody want to, to deal with these problems. It's too risky, too expensive. The best way and the cheapest way is to work mon uh, monitoring from outside, what's it called? Remote, remote monitoring. Very good example that gave the chance to the local organization to take a a rule and to be mentioned always on the on any international media. It's not because we feel, it's not because we should do this, it's because we cannot access this area because it's too dangerous. Lack of information is true. Why? Because most of the work done inside Syria is built firstly, as Rana told, on Syrians maybe who left the country, who speak the donor language and who is not able anymore to access Syria. So there is lack of information and then there is lack of priority and then there is lack. Thank you so much, Rizam. We are out of time, but John and Nigel, do you have any final comments and remarks, whether on the questions or more generally on what Rana and Rizam have just talked um, about? Just one last point about capacity. Um, I think it depends on how you define capacity. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always reminded of the work that I did in Afghanistan, where down in Helmand, where they were producing marketing and 
exporting products of opium like nobody else in the world was able to do. And when we were down in Helmand, I was told the problem down there was capacity. I mean, for goodness sake, you know, uh, we, we really must look more seriously at what we mean by capacity. Capacity for what? And, and I think somebody was quite right uh, earlier on to say that, yes, if they speak English, they've got capacity, and if they don't speak English, they haven't got capacity. So uh, we have to be very careful of this. Um, uh, and uh, the other thing that I, I, I just wanted to say, um, and this is, um, in a sense, not in my, my formal capacity as the, uh, as the uh, evaluator for DFID, but just to say that one thing we came across in Syria over and over again was a profound disappointment uh, expressed by many people from Syria, a profound disappointment in the British government, actually, in the way in which uh, they have used aid almost to offset the guilt for not having dealt effectively with this situation uh, way back five years ago when the, um, when the opposition first arose and felt and, and feel now that they've been um, fobbed off, in a sense, with aid rather than actual assistance in the resistance that was perpetrated and started very effectively all those years ago. Uh, and that somehow aid is the is the uh, uh, is the, is is the, the remaining guilt for our incapacity to deal more effectively with a much more profound crisis. Thank you, John. Nigel. Wish there were more guilt. I think it's in short supply. Um, I think Wesan Wesan has been incredibly uh, articulate about the issues uh, faced. Um, but I wanted to maybe end with a, a question. Perhaps it's to, to Ran and Wesam, um, and I may be out of date. But we focus so much on the sectarian divide, and obviously it's in our face every day. Um, the commentary that Syria and Iraq are finished as countries. Um, and so my question is, has the, you know, these were terrible regimes in both, but but there was a, a, a level of, of understanding, tolerance, if I can call it, amongst groups, Sunni, Shia, Christian, you name it. Um, and when I was there in 13, 14, and so on, um, interacting with, with, with different groups of Syrians, tribal and, and various sectarian, people kept on saying, at the end of the day, we are Syrians, and we love our country. So I think about that, and I think, is, does that mean uh, naively one should hope for the future once the guns are put down? Um, and my experience in so many conflict situations is if people, again, start to get to know it together, if they have jobs, if they have social services, if they have education, if they have hope for the future, they put down their guns. Now, that's a long-term aspiration, but is that totally naive? That's the question. And then I would say... I would think we have to put much higher on everyone's agenda, thinking of Syria's post-conflict future, whenever that may be. And I think we have to look into that and imagine the future, as I said, which is not going to be the past, and then look back from that imagined future to see how it might influence an action now. What do we have to do differently? The youth democratic, uh, demographic, which, are, which in Syria, as elsewhere, is empowered through connectivity and social media, but disempowered traditionally by their governments. They want work and opportunity. How can that be provided? Um, and I, I think, again, to come back with something I said earlier, it's just we external actors just need so much more knowledge, a much better understanding of the environments in which, which we parachute, if I may say. Um, the preparedness, the risk and vulnerability analysis, which must end the divide between humanitarians and development folks so that we can support uh, the agency of local actors much better. Thank you. Thank you, Nadja. In one minute, because we're out of time, can we be hopeful, positive about the future of Syria, Rana and Wesam? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like the Palestinian uh, <laughs> poet, <laughs> we cannot be but hopeful in the end of the day. But oh, just one thing. Um, I think no other war has been more covered than Syria. And, you know, I'm just totally shocked when people tell me, you know, we still need to do a whole study about this, you know, to, to move forward, you know, and I just stand, really, 
what more than this uh, do we need? I think it's more about the, the intent to actually do something. This is where we're stopping. I came from Syria um, since two days. So I was in Damascus, Homs, La Latakia, and other areas. I was visiting mainly the Palestinian camps, but also I visited, as normally it is like, all, most of the Syrian areas there. There is nobody who wants to fight. There is no Syrian in the Free Syrian Army or in the regime uh, army who want to fight. Everybody is tired. Nobody wants to fight. As long as we, we are looking for hope, we should look who is funding this war. If the funding for this war stop, this war will stop. It's that easy. We can speak about hope and we can speak about reconciliation and we can speak about justice and about civil society and local governance and all this, and relief and the humanitarian aid and all this. Why we don't speak about who is funding this war? ISIS controls South Damascus. South Damascus is besieged from the government from all the sides, like this, in a circle. There is a fight going on in this area since three years. How the arms are entering, how the bullets are provided, who is funding this? Information and uh, who is this? Everybody inside the country knows. Here, maybe there is uh, lack of information, lack of voices, but everybody inside Syria knows exactly each militia, each person, each who is funding this and from where it's coming and from where. There is a hope if there is a real will from the international community to take responsibility and to take their uh, moral responsibility firstly about what's happening in Syria. Not 250,000 died. There is more than 500,000 died. There is 500,000 people missing. We don't know where they are. Uh, I have five volunteers missing. I don't know where they are since four years. Uh, this is a, there is a big will inside the Syrian people. The Syrian people lived with each other since long time. Sunni, Alawite, I don't know what, Palestinian, Syrian, Kurdish. I lived in, in a school 12 years near a person. I discovered this year that he is an Alawite. We didn't know about this before. And we lived with each other. Uh, Hope is still, I mean, for sure. Uh, Palestinians are 60 years and they, we have still hope, so I am here. So I wish it will not be the same. But just one thing, not out of moral, out of self-interest, pure self-interest, a, a fragile state cannot but bring more fragility to the world. So please, no, we're not talking about morals, just out of pure self-interest. Thank you so. very much. Thank you to all the panelists. We have gone over time, but I think it was well worth it. Um, I think we've had such a, an honest, open, and humbling discussion. And thanks particularly to Rana Wessam for that. Um, but please join me in thanking our panel. It's been fantastic. Nigel, thank you for leaking up from Kathmandu. And thanks, John. Thank you very much. Thank you.